All right, good afternoon. My name is Linus Lancaster. I'm a uh, high school art teacher up in Healdsburg, which is about an hour north of here. Um, and I also uh, volunteer periodically with the Park Service. Um, the Park Service, I know, has a mixed environmental legacy, so it probably is noteworthy that the Park Service is not aware that I volunteer for them. Um, my activities are a little bit clandestine. It also serves as a cover for some of the grill installations that we do, which are not uh, sanctified by them. Um, and what I'm talking about today is a series of art projects that were done collaboratively with my students there and um, driven by the dissertation that work that I did in soil studies. Um, and so it's a series of art projects which are driven by a variety of um, theories and systems of philosophy that we came up with. And I'm not going to read a theory paper or try to go too in-depth about the philosophical stuff. Mostly I want to show you the projects and images. Um, but just to kind of set the groundwork a little bit, I'll read just a bit and then get into some of the images that we're going to be looking at. Um, <clears throat> so what we're referring to as dirty philosophy, or soil objects, if you will, is based on the idea of looking at soil as a teacher. Uh, its lessons are humility, humor, mystery, site-specific value, reciprocity, and deep listening, among many others. Uh, soilogic thinking emerges from network theory, linear and nonlinear, Western and more than Western philosophical modalities. This is what drives the art projects that I'm presenting today. The current focus on radio may seem a little bit puzzling in the context of um, ecology, but intimacy is the kernel of ecology in many ways. And intimacy begins with communication. So here we go. <clears throat> Um, so I started out studying soil almost by accident. I did an MA in political philosophy, which was um, looking at the politics of land use, specifically border politics. And transitioning from an MA to writing a dissertation, I wasn't able to, I wasn't allowed just to, you know, continue doing the same thing that I had done before. So I had to come up with something new, and reaching straight down into the ground seemed like the logical approach, and what do you come up with but a handful of dirt? Um, and so soil became the thing, and it was felt like I was being chosen by it rather than the, than the reverse. And um, so I began getting involved with this stuff and looking at soil pedans and all of this. Um, the first project that I did was trying to raise awareness among the community in Healdsburg about different soil typologies and to increase a degree of uh, interest in local soil and, and local soil differences. But rather than take a bunch of dirt into a museum or a gallery, as has been done before, I thought that the logical thing to do would be to take the exhibit out into the soil environment itself and to create a gallery outside that would be literally made out of the dirt that I was showcasing. And along with this pit itself, along the walls are various soil types from all over Sonoma County that were frescoed and baked and, and kind of dealt with. Um, this was a very initial project that we did back in 2010. It was a little problematic in that after digging it, which took only a few hours, um, I spent the night out there with it prior to the exhibit and with the feng shui being as disrupted as it was, it was very uncomfortable. And I realized that um, in many ways, although I was trying to celebrate soil and to raise awareness and interest about it, that this very act of creating this gallery in itself could be looked at as a desecration. And uh, along with that, I kind of had to make a deal with the devil about the location, which I had been looking for for over a year um, up in the vineyards in Healdsburg. And so I resolved not to do anything like this again, but it was, a, uh, but it was an outset of the project of beginning to get involved with this. The next phase was to begin to bring dirt into the classroom, which we do and I've continued to do in a wide variety of ways. I use it in my ceramics classes and in my regular two-dimensional art classes as well. This is local Zamora clay loam, which we get from a deposit which is close by. And um, this is a way for all of my students to get their hands in dirt and squish it around and it makes your skin tingle. And it has this wonderful exfoliating effect and it gets your skin all smooth. It's like a trip to the day spa, but it's free. Um, and it forces my students to kind of get involved with that. 
We, uh, we began making seed bombs and to go out and reseeding areas that were badly eroded or barren out in the community. One of the things about traditional seed bombs is they're round, and so even though they're meant for remote gardening, especially in areas that are hard to get to, if you throw a round seed bomb up into a ravine, it's just gonna roll back down to your feet, as we found. So we started changing up the shape and putting outriggers on them. And then the next phase was to begin to adjust their pH balance to account for the local soil typologies and with the hope of um, having them be a little bit more successful. Most of us, are accustomed to hearing about flash mobs from time to time. Flash mobs tend to be zombies or whatever anybody comes up with. Ours were the forest floor rising up and invading a small town, which was very scary to some people. Um, and the responses were quite mixed, as you can see. Um, following those activities, though, I decided that in order to try to learn really what it was that soil had to teach us, that I needed to begin to learn from original experience or uh, direct experience it, it dealt with in, a, in an original way. And being a Westerner, I don't know how to talk to rocks and trees and dirt, or I didn't at the time. And so that was really the, the driving question of my project is, how can I learn to communicate with these more than human materials? And um, there's, a, of course, an entire world of knowledge based from indigenous societies all over the world that take this ability for granted, but I can't simply go and borrow their practices, obviously. So I had to try to do it on my own and to see if it would even be possible to do that. So I started turning to a variety of meditative techniques, some of which are known and some of which were improvisational. This was one that was playing around, just sort of tongue in cheek, playing around with the idea of, of connecting with the site-specific location to see if, to see what would happen in, in terms of cultivating a relationship with that place. Um, so since then, I've been calling this shallow stream meditation. Um, I'm not sure, it's probably been done before, but um, it was just, as I said, initially it was tongue in cheek, put on scuba equipment and go lie down in a, you know, in a creek bed and, and get some good images of it. Well, there were a lot of surprises. The water was shockingly cold, and I, even with a wetsuit on, and I expected that this would be a distraction from, cult from developing a, uh, a meditative state, but actually it, it facilitated it very quickly to, to bring on this, this kind of meditative state, um, and I found it to be remarkably effective, and so I've, I've continued to use it, and then since then I've, I've branched out into trying to use it as a way to kind of rearrange some of the energies of, of site-specific cultural blockages like churches and banks and things like that, and so it's become a performative uh, aspect of our projects as well. Um, one of the things that I, I tried to do is to figure out, you know, how do I position within Western philosophy the concept that soil is an ethical subject? That is, it is a living thing with which we are in a relationship, and, and in order to try to facilitate people's understanding that it's a living thing so that they can understand that we are in a relationship to it and, and to value it on an emotional level, is, is a little bit of a difficult thing. Of course, in this group of people at this conference, it, it's kind of a given, but out there in broader society, this seems very alien to a lot of people. And I was kind of joking around with a colleague that, you know, well, what are you working on? Oh, I'm trying to learn how to communicate with rocks. And, and, and to position them as ethical subjects. And it's like an ethical subject, does that mean we have to start being nice to them now? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely it does. And if you don't believe me, here's a picture of Mount Rushmore before it was obscenely desecrated. And, and doesn't that suggest to you that perhaps not the treatment of a pebble per se as such, but a site-specific location might be very important. Um, as a way to try to bring this to the general public, uh, the thing to do seemed to be to get some monuments out there, and um, this is where the ranger outfit comes into play. This was an installation up at Yosemite. You can see El Capitan and Half Dome in the background, and this was a, a, a piece of flagstone with a plaque on it, and you don't see it in the photograph, but with a, a sanding dremel, I had dremeled in a, a handprint 
as a suggestion that people would place their hands on this. The noise canceling headphones were hung on it and we took this out to a scenic overlook and installed it there thinking that first off I was going to get busted for impersonating an officer on some level, second of all that there would be nobody there to see it and that we'd run away and have no idea what would happen. None of the above uh, happened as it was. As we were in the process of installing this, there were two busloads of tourists that just pulled in. Um, as we were installing it, and so I hadn't even finished putting this thing in, and I had 25 people lined up behind me waiting to try this hands-on interactive monument for the very first time. And um, it, was, it was just really, really cool. There were a bunch of people there and uh, trying out the monument. Um, so I'm going to read you what the plaque says. The, the plaque is a, is a very condensed version of this, but this is what I came up with along the way to try to get people to understand what it would be like to think in terms of trans species and trans material communication outside of the conventions of human um, conversation. Trans species communication is not far enough removed from human conversation to be surprising, nor is there a great leap from communicatively interacting with domestic animals to doing so with non-domestic ones. We all understand what's communicated by a growl or a scratch behind the ears. They're often reciprocal and can be mutually complex. Communicatively complex relationships certainly exist between more than human species. From here it may become easier to see communicative relationships between animals and plants. When some plants are being eaten, it's been shown that others around them are aware of it and react in various ways. There are plants that when being eaten by caterpillars and other insects release pheromones that attract wasps who are predators for those insects. This too is a form of communication. <clears throat> Plants and mineral entities interact with each other in complex symbiotic ways. The geology of subsoils significantly influences the types of plants which live on it, who in turn calibrate the soil dynamics, such as by fixing nitrogen to their liking, and at the same time excrete chemicals that affect the erosion rates of the rocks. These interrelations may function below what we conventionally understand as communication and in slower temporalities, but it's not an imaginative stretch to see them as part of a continuum. If you hold a rock in your hand as part of a divination practice, it can communicate a great deal to you, if only as a way of attempting to externalize a thought process. But even as a simple physical act, the rock may cool your hand or produce a pleasing sensation. In turn, you have warmed it, creating in effect one extra day of warming and cooling, subtly hastening its process of returning to soil. Looked at in this way, communication can be seen more broadly as physical exchanges, particularly open systems of exchange, as suggested by the behaviors of non-discrete life forms. While some more than Western cultures understand transspecies and transmaterial communication on largely liminal levels, communication may start as effectively through sheer physical interaction, which expands communicative definitions. In other words, if you want what I found in the process of attempting to learn how to talk to rocks, is that it simply requires you to change your definition of communication. And it would be very easy to walk up to somebody and say, well, all you have to do to learn to talk to rocks and trees and rivers is to change your definition of communication so that you're not thinking of it as a conversation anymore, but rather an interaction and an exchange of energies. And, and it's e easy to say that, but without any experience to back it up, they're not going to be able to feel what you're saying. And so that's really the challenge that, that presents itself. Um, so we began to pursue the line of communication, and um, some of you are familiar with Rudolf Steiner's uh, formula for ideal fertilizer, where, you're ta where there, he's uh, prescribing to use cow horns, which um, retain some of the astrality, the, the cosmic life force that comes down. And, and according to him, um, cows ant antlers of, of cows and other animals acted as antennas for this astrality and channeled it directly to their stomachs where it aided in the digestive system and that even after the animal passes and you've got this horn remaining that it retains some residual 
astrality and life force, and so he prescribed packing it with manure, letting it sit for a year and a half, and then mixing that with water and spraying it on plants. That was his formula for ideal fertilizer, which has a lot of scientific basis to it as well. So we, we started looking at translating that wholesale over into electronics as a way to kind of make inroads into um, alternative modalities of communication. So we started building these primitive radios. This radio actually works. It's a cow bone. You can make a radio out of anything that you can wrap wire around. It's called a foxhole radio. Soldiers in World War II used to make these out of anything that they could you know, find out of their kits. It is a razor blade, a pencil, a safety pin. Um, and it works by cutting the radio. It has no power source, so they're very quiet. You really have to lean into it and be in a quiet environment. But I have picked up KCBS in San Francisco and KSRO Sonoma on this and listened to it. Um, here's a radio that's made out of dirt. It's uh, mixed in with uh, acrylic gel, so it became rigid, but um, it's Zamora clay loam that you saw in previous images, and then on the top of it is a layer of dirt from Spain that a friend of mine sent me uh, from Catalonia, and this again is a working radio that, um, that you can listen, pick up stations with. Um, Fast forward a little bit to the stuff that's going on in the border right now, and I decided that perhaps radio would be an interesting and playful way to try to evaporate this border to some extent and see if we could go down there and kind of mess around with the dynamics of that environment. So I got my boat and, and went on down to the border. Um, I had been talking with a colleague about taking radios and walking around and clipping them onto random things and seeing if you could use them as antennas. And she said that she had been doing this on the ranch that she grew up on and had had a tremendous amount of success with barbed wire fences. And I, it had never occurred to me to try a barbed wire fence before I had been using my own hand-built um, Steinarian-based kind of antennas. Um, and I thought, wow, that's such a cool idea, but if I'm going to try clipping into a fence, I'm not going to go for a barbed wire fence just copying what she did. If I'm going to use a fence, I want to use the fence. So <laughs> off I went down to San Ysidro, and I thought, okay, I'm going to clip into the border fence and see if I can use that as an antenna to, to receive these signals. Well, when I got down there, the problem is, is that there's a secondary fence that keeps you away from the larger one. They don't want you to get close to it. It's illegal to, to go up right next to it and, and touch it. So I drove all around trying to find a place to get through, and I couldn't find anything until I went by the Border Patrol station. And the Border Patrol station has an open... Uh, access to this, of course, because they drive their trucks in to patrol it. It's a, it's a police station, so there are no signs about no trespassing, and they left their gate open. So I, I walked right in, and it helps to be dressed like this when you're doing these things. And um, so I had to scramble up the embankment, but of course that embankment is covered with sensors, so I was setting, lighting them all off like crazy. They knew I was there, but it, it took them a while to find where I was and to come after me. Um, but in the meantime, and the other thing was, I, I expected to be jumped by border security in some fashion or another, and I thought, they're going to confiscate my camera. So um, I had to have some kind of backup, so my students and I built this stealth cam um, that has a camera in it, and this was in the, in the brush. This, this was in the brush behind me. My students did a beautiful job of building this bird's nest, and it, it had a, a camera in it that was... Um, that was supposed to be live streaming to uh, some station in case I got, you know, hauled away. Um, but we would have preserved the images. So I did it. I was able to get right up against the primary border fence. That's a, a little radio that's made out of uh, clay with, all, with its little components. I did clip into it and attempted to get a listen. And, and I got this photograph um, until Border Patrol rolled up on me. Now, um, one of the things that I've learned as an activist is that humor is your best friend because if, if you're playing, they're not reading malicious intent out of you. And again, it helps to look like this. Um, and so the, the guy was just like, what are you doing here? And it's like, oh, hi, I'm a high school teacher here doing a project with my students. And he's like, oh, my God, get out. You're not supposed to be here. And just, you know, I said, okay, well, I'm on my way out. But before I go, can I take a couple of pictures? And he said, like, hurry up. You know, and so it, it wasn't what I expected, which was to be, you know, put on the ground and stomped on. Um, so that, that, that worked out surprisingly well. 
So it went down to the border and there's the Steinerian radio antenna with the cow horns and they're full of manure and quartz. And again, it's, it's taking organic concepts and just trying to bring them over wholesale into electronics. Um, before I went, I got my ham radio license because I knew I would be interacting with law enforcement and, and you can't, you can use CB uh, or walkie-talkies without a license, but a ham radio which would, would communicate with the, um, uh, with the repeaters over in Tijuana requires a license. So I got licensed and, and went and did the setup um, and attempted to throw radio signals back and forth across the border. But it wasn't just my intent to communicate with somebody in Tijuana. I wanted to evaporate the border by, in a sense, being two places at once. And I couldn't do that on land, but I thought, at sea, I can. So my students and I built this radio buoy and um, there it is on the shore, and, and my, my intent was to get out on the water where the border fence runs down into the ocean, set the buoy adrift on a tether, and let it drift up to or across the border, and I would be sending radio signals back and forth between my rowboat and the buoy, in a sense, erasing the border. Um, Yes, it is a Weber. <laughs> uh, it's got a weather station on it and a camera and a bunch of radio equipment on the inside. Um, now, you, you can't launch a boat there, and I couldn't get my boat anywhere close by because the road was closed, and so I, real, I found once I was down there, at least this first time, that the only way I was going to get my buoy out on the water was to swim in with it. I was very, very unhappy about that. There are warning signs up all over the place about raw sewage and dangerous currents and, and one thing after another, so it scared the shit out of me. But, um, but I forced myself to go in with it. And the thing is, is that the buoy was made to be towed behind a rowboat, not to be towed through breaking waves, and so it got damaged and started to fill up with water um, as I was towing it behind me. So I did get video of this, but most of it is underwater because the buoy was flipped upside down. But I got it, I didn't even realize this as I was towing it, but I got out past the break and I thought, you know, things are starting to go pretty well. And right then a fin popped up in front of me. It was probably a dolphin, but my story is it was a great white, of course. Well, I turned around and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. Um, so I had to go back again. And so I went back and this time I tried launching from Imperial Beach, which is two miles up. And so I, I was able to get the rowboat down to the water and you can see the radio buoy there. And I had some, some friends with me. Um, as I, it took me about an hour to set up. As I was doing so, I found that, uh, I, it turned out that I was right underneath the, the Coast Guard surveillance camera um, on the beach. And the, the lifeguards are part of the police department in San Diego. The Coast Guard contacted them, sent them out, and the guy rolled up on me and he's like, yeah, so the Coast Guard wants to know what you're up to. So we had a very long conversation. It lasted for over an hour. Um, they wouldn't let me go in. But when you're out doing this kind of field work, you, you find allies in unexpected places. Turns out the cop was a graffiti artist and, and was like, he was, really loved our project, but he just w couldn't allow me to go in because he thought the boat was going to sink and become a, a submerged hazard. But he said, if you ever come back, here's what you do. You stay behind that camera, you bring a kayak like everybody else does, you get all ready, and then you run in and go, and everything will be fine. It's like, okay, thank you. So um, coming up in a few weeks, I'm going back. Um, but before I do, or before I did, um, I heard about the Chevron oil spill down in the McKittrick oil fields. Uh, it had started leaking in May, and it, when I heard about it, it was early July, and they had not done a thing to stop this. It was... It was uh, they had a new fracking well that was right next to an old one that was retired or, or plugged. And, and what frequently happens when they put them too close together is that one well will pressurize another one and cause it to start leaking. Um, this one had leaked 850,000 gallons out into this ravine and they thought, well, to the, their way of thinking, no harm, no foul, right? There's no aquifer here. Uh, it's on our property. Just let it go and, and ignore it. Somebody saw it probably from the air and reported it and the state finally came in months later and forced them to get in and try to clean it up. By the time they got in and finished it, it had grown to um, over a million gallons. And so I did what anybody 
would do maybe, which was to go get a biohazard suit and a kayak and uh, went off down there and I thought if I could get a shot of kayaking on this oil slick, that would be pretty frigging heroic. Um, so I did and I went off down there and it was really interesting though because I've been working down in these oil fields for a long time and the first time I went down there in 2006, it was very, very quiet. There wasn't a lot going on. And, and this picture doesn't show how close together that some of these wells really are because it was right next to the road. But if you get out into them, they're stacked on top of each other. If you look closely, you can see all those silver pipes kind of off in the distance. Those are all new. That's fracking. Those pipes are carrying steam and water filled with benzene and, and whatever. Um, so the fracking boom really, really has, has dramatically increased the amount of activity. Uh, going on down there, as well as the pollution, which you can, you know, smell, of course. Um, so, I didn't actually get out onto the oil slick because I was swarmed by private security, but not for lack of effort. And then, do you have a play button on the computer? Is it on the computer screen? Oh, nothing's moving. Uh, it may be the interface. At any rate, I was, I was off stage there, and then this was just the, the spill is off to the right, and I had just walked in from off camera and then dragging the uh, kayak and then down into the ravine um, on my way to go there. Uh, but right after doing that is, um, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, bla literally the Black Lagoon. Um, three trucks, about six or seven people. Um, before they chased me off, I got a big lecture about um, the hypocrisy of northern cities using all the oil and sending all their pollution down to Bakersfield and then, come in, and then trying to shut the whole industry down. And, and I wasn't going to argue with them at that point. I was just like, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, and then the, the police followed in and by then I was on my way. Um, but I did get this picture before I left. When, I was, when I've watched the other presentations uh, at, this, at this conference, which I valued a great deal, and, and it's just wonderful to see so many people that are out doing these practical things that are really making a difference and really going out and getting the job done. And I think, well, you know, this avant-garde performance art, what does it really accomplish in the long run? Um, but part of the blockage that society, that functions within society towards doing better on behalf of soil has to do with a lot of things. It, fear, ignorance, greed, corporatism, and so forth. But once you start talking about corporatism, you're, start, you're talking about fascism. And if you're going to fight fascism, one of the things that you have to begin to understand is just how tricky and slippery it is. And one of its greatest accomplishments is hiding in plain sight. And one of the things about fascism that is not always commonly understood is that it gets its tentacles into aspects of our lives before we're aware that it's doing that. And if any of you are familiar with some of the work of like Antonio Negri or Michael Hart or some of these people that have written uh, from a, a Marxist perspective about the way that fascism operates, one of the points they make is that increasingly it is affecting our intellectual lives and the totality of life in ways that we're often not even aware of. And so my feeling is as a, as a, as a conceptual artist, 
that what I have to offer to the situation is that as fascism begins functioning on increasingly abstract levels that it also has to be fought on increasingly abstract levels and to do so with humor and creativity has a tremendous benefit because humor and creativity is precisely what upends fascism because it can't be commodified and so these projects which are not marketable in galleries and they're not for sale um, are, are things that are disruptive of fascism and, and part of my proof of that is that I've been working this way for years and, and for all the dozens of interactions that I've had with law enforcement and private security, never once have I been uh, really you know, beaten or arrested or anything like that. And as my students point out to me, unfortunately some of it also has to do with my skin color and the fact that I dress the part um, and that's real. But uh, but it's also it's also part of the nature of the of the work. And one of the biggest lessons that I've learned along the way, being an activist, is that again, humor is the best possible way to approach these things because the uh, because the status quo simply doesn't know how to handle it. And um, and. When I, when I did the installation up in Yosemite, I was r terrified that I was going to get busted for wearing too authentic looking a uniform uh, and for installing something in a public park that was not authorized. The public loved it, and then once I got used to, to interacting with people, I ended up, because that was early in the morning, I ended up going down into Yosemite Valley and I spent the whole day interacting with people down in the park you know, c people would come up to me and it's like, uh, excuse me, sir, is it okay if I set my barbecue up here? And it's like, sure, hey, by the way, do you know the soil typology of what's going on here? It's called Steinbeck loam. Are you familiar with the writer? Yeah, feel, isn't that texture amazing, you know? And um, so there's a tremendous opportunity for educational outreach along with the wonderful things that, that everyone here is doing. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attention.